Hey everybody, so today we have a really special guest and that is Ed Hoffman, who has just come out with a new book. This is not a paid promotion. I just think it's a really good book and Ed is a really cool guy. We had a fabulous time doing this interview. I have a feeling he's gonna be on the channel a little bit more because I think he has a lot more to say and I have a lot more to learn from him as well. So if you are interested in learning more, his book is linked down below. And if you wanna just hear what he has to say about the knowledge management in NASA and some of his lessons learned through that journey, please stick around. It's wonderful to be here. I'm very excited that uh, that we're having this discussion. And um, as you know, I'm Ed Hoffman. I spent most of my career at NASA. I was the founding director of the NASA Academy for Program Project and Engineering Leadership, and I was the first NASA Chief Knowledge Officer, and I look forward to our conversation. Yeah, Chief Knowledge Officer. So for those that might not be uh, right. familiar, or those that are just trying to figure out what their title should be, because right, right. these are not typical, you know, I, I don't think there's any one common way. So what, how would you describe what that is? My family didn't know what, what I've done for, for all these years. Really what uh, the essential essence of success for most organizations uh, really comes down to tapping into knowledge, expertise, creativity, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's about how do you develop it when you need it? Mm -hmm. um, how do you find it when it's in your organization? And how do you most uh, important, how do you share it across an organization? And so that's typically what a chief knowledge officer does make sure the workforce is uh, using the expertise, the talent uh, that it has, both from a standpoint of technology, and even more important from its people. Yeah, and and I love that. That's that's really the focus. And I I actually have a hard copy here. Also, for those it. that are watching, um, if you are subscribed and you leave a comment on your favorite part of this video down below you can get a copy of this. I'm going to put a raffle out for, for the copy of the book. So, so thank you to Ed and, and my team. Thank Press you, Ashley. Yeah. For, for the review copy. That's, yeah. that's the, the perk I get for reading it that I give back to the audience. That is cool. No, that's very nice. Yeah. yeah it's a good opportunity. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's... one thing I, I really loved about this book, Ed, is your emphasis on what I've always said is, is the most important part of everything. And it's so good to hear you and the other authors um, describe it this way is the people are the most important part and yeah. the knowledge that the human aspect brings to the table. And those are some of the things that you highlight the most in the book, you know, going through some of the things that I picked up on was the culture and the learning and the storytelling were like common themes. So could you walk us through a little bit, you know, what, why, why do you think, because you say this is, this is kind of a, a shift in thinking. Why do you think that that isn't the way that is commonly um, associated with, with this is kind of thing? Yeah, I think um, in a nutshell, I think that in, in the workplace, uh, we've been raised, particularly men have been raised to be afraid of emotions. Uh, we were raised to kind of uh, learn the best, do the best in school, learn the processes, learn the technologies, and that if you do those processes right, everything will go well. And I spent my career at a uh, at NASA, right, ultimately around science and engineering, that yeah. the difference between success and failure always comes down to the human element, mm -hmm. always comes down to the human element. Mm -hmm. uh, now you need the uh, the technology, you need the expertise, but it's in your people. You know, yep. that's where your knowledge is. So, you know, is it different for you when you're working for someone you really like, you engage, who you know, respects you, where you're yeah. growing and developing and uh, compared to when you're working with someone who doesn't communicate with you? And well, I think for everyone, they'll say that. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And there's so many studies that say, that you don't leave a job, you leave a boss That's in, right. in many ways. And I I can say that, you know, it's not always been true for me. Sometimes it's, well, there's a cool opportunity somewhere. And I have yeah. been the type to leave a job crying because I'm going to miss my family at, at my job. Yeah. Um, so so that it's not always the reason people leave a job, but it's a right. very common reason that people will leave a job. And, you know, I, I love the way that, that you also piece together that, you know, each person, even though they have a resume of skills, they have an extra twist, right? Everybody has that one thing that they're, they're really spectacular at. And it might not even be something that shows up on a resume. 
And so being able to cultivate that, I think, and understand that that's, you know, something that can really benefit a project is, is really uh, a big impact. So in, in your experience, Ed, how would you say, you know, if there was a first step in taking this shift away from, well, here are the technologies and the skills that we need, and those are important, but also shifting to the focus, also the people involved are also very important here. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, um, you know, it's, it's what we're doing. It's what you're doing right now. You bring a lot of energy. I I got a smile. (laughs) When I meet from you, you're very engaging. You've Thank been very you. uh, welcoming. And I think, you know, we're people at the end yeah. of the day. Um, you know, uh, you know, dogs, when they meet each other, they smell each other. <laughs> yeah. People, when they meet each other, they look at each other, they talk to each other, mm-hmm. and they fairly quickly make a decision. Do I want to be in this relationship? Mm-hmm. That's true of work. Mm-hmm. And um, it, it's basically uh, looking at the, you know, those research that I found done to go outside of NASA at Google. Mm-hmm. You know, called Project Aristotle. Mm-hmm. And the Aristotle project was where they were trying to explain what is it that leads to their most successful teams. Mm-hmm. And they came, one of the conclusions they came to teams that have more women mm-hmm. are higher performing. Mm-hmm. And uh, I don't think it's it's just the, the aspect of women. It's the fact that women have been raised to have more of a focus on emotions, on relationships, uh, taking care of children, uh, taking care of men, often <laughs> and uh, but it, it's really the notion of the import motions matter to us. And one yeah. of the things that can be difficult is working at a distance. Mm-hmm. Right. So how do you do that? Well, we have our our, you know, our cameras on. Yeah. So I can see you. I can see kind yeah. of when you're happy. I can see if maybe you're losing it. Uh, one of the things that in many of the successful teams, they talk about their mission. Why are we here? Mm-hmm. Um, we're motivated by the possibilities of what we're doing. Uh, if you get excited about the work, about the interview, mm-hmm. about what's happening, then you deal with the natural problems and the issues uh, and the challenges that come up. Yeah. I think the starting point is really probably one of gratitude. Yeah. Being grateful for the fact that we get to work together. I'm getting a <laughs> chance to talk to you, Ashley, and meeting you, and maybe it leads to something. But for this time, yeah. uh, it's fun. It's a good experience. That That's what humans are about. Humans are, are uh, they'll, they'll emphasize the story. Uh, yeah. more than the data just because it's it's how we operate. Yeah, and I and I love that because, you know, there's <clears throat> a, a few conversations that I've had uh over the last few months. One I think was emphasized by Juan Zakeda who was talking about empathy. I think yeah. that that empathetic view is is that nurturing aspect that a lot of people can have that make a good right. uh manager or a good teammate. Uh, you know, I I know some of my my past teams have said I've been one of their best managers, not because I could you know get the best numbers or you know I I led the team through these tough times. Although those were true too, right, um, right. they said, and I quote, like you're human, you 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 care about us, and we know that, uh, right. especially during you know the tough times with you know the. I'm not going to say the the p word because YouTube doesn't like it, but the the, the yeah. thing that that everybody was suffering from the last three years, yeah. um, you know, if you didn't have that empathetic view, if it was all about the numbers, if it was all about just getting the work done and nothing else, humans are not just cogs, right? Like we have those emotions, we have struggles. Having that that empathetic view to understand, okay, this is not maybe working the way we want to, or this person isn't hitting the numbers, doesn't always mean that they are purposely doing that. Having that empathetic view thinks, hmm, maybe something's going on at home. Maybe something's going on at work that I don't understand. Reaching out, asking those questions makes a world of difference. And if people are miserable, they're not going to do as well at their the projects they're working on, right? Like So, so there is right. that, that harder science piece Right. Where it's like, if you're if you are that happier person, you are probably going to right. to be able to do your work a little bit better. And we know that the emotions drive that kind of environment uh, to being successful. Again, the Google Project Aristotle, you mm-hmm. can people can find that. I'll talk to it at NASA. Going back to uh, when I first started working with NASA, mm-hmm. I was doing competencies of the most effective leaders. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, so you have the things you expect in there in terms of the technical 
capability. But the heaviest emphasis was uh, the interpersonal, yeah. the leadership, the yeah. what's called the emotional intelligence. Uh, the other aspect of it is the, the systemic understanding and appreciation the larger system. Yeah. So these are the things that come together. And, uh, and I think what's unusual about the book and what's probably been unusual about my career is um, I've always emphasized if you go on to, to LinkedIn, one of the things mm -hmm. that says people, people, people. Mm -hmm. And in a nutshell, that's that's to me at the bottom line. I've seen teams with really committed people, yeah, people who take care of each other. They have the mm -hmm. expertise. And despite many of the problems in the environment, they overcame it. Yeah. And I've seen uh, many teams that had the, the highest technical expertise in the discipline areas. Mm -hmm. But they for different reasons, they did not trust or like each other. Yeah. They and uh, it, it's led to problems. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. And, you know, the, the other thing that, that you mentioned was um, that that storytelling. Right. I think that. Vital. Yeah. It, it, and I, I had an advisor in, in college that would always say, you know, go to the conferences, even if you know a lot of the technology they're talking about, because you need a good dose of vitamin N. Yeah. Vitamin networking, networking, networking. networking. Yeah. It's people. And it's not, you know, favoritism or cronyism or anything of those things. It's that if you can see somebody on a page, right, or in a presentation, that's one very thin slice of what that person really is and what they are all about. And if you can see that passion from someone, from a conversation, I mean, right. I know a lot of people have, you know, you said it too, that I have a lot of passion for this and it shows right. because I do, it's not like you can't fake this stuff. <laughs> you can try, right. it doesn't come off very well. Yeah, people are very aware. Uh, yes. They we we sense this. I got to tell you a quick story uh, yeah. to illustrate the importance. Because one of the things that I've said uh, is that I think uh, the the factor that helped NASA develop over the last thirty years was the use of story. Mm -hmm. And story, uh, one of the things I've learned has a lot of purposes, but at the core, it really uh, it encourages empathy. Mm -hmm. You know, when you let me tell a story, we exactly. know each other closer. Yeah, and um, I um, I got into NASA in the early '80s after the um, the uh, Challenger space shuttle disaster. This goes way back, goes back to '86. Yep. But NASA had to do a lot of internal reflection. Yeah, this was the organization of Apollo, and now it's uh, it's dealing with this disaster. And uh, we started up uh, the the Learning Academy mm -hmm. uh, around that, mm -hmm. and for different reasons, I was appointed to that. Mm -hmm. And I was uh, I was in my late twenties. I mean, what do you? How do you do this? And one of the things is I started looking at who are the best leaders mm -hmm. in the area. Who are the best project managers, engineers? And I would invite them to come talk to the classes. In addition mm -hmm. to the other thing, nice. And one of the best leaders at the time was a wonderful uh, man named Jerry Madden. Mm -hmm. Jerry Madden was one of the best project uh, leaders at the Goddard Space Flight Center. Mm -hmm. And in addition to be, being a great project manager, he probably developed more future generations of project people because they followed him, they loved him, yeah. they listened to him. Yeah. And I asked him to talk and he said, I'll, I'm happy to talk with two things. I won't wear a tie or a jacket. In those era, it was always, yeah. said, I won't do yeah, that. Yeah. And I won't use slides. Mm -hmm. He said, I'm just going to you know, share stories. He said that. Yeah. I said, Jerry, you do whatever you want to do. <laughs> and he got down there. And he started, and one story that I loved that I never forgot was he talked about uh, working a small mission with the uh, between NASA and the German Space Agency, DLR. And he said one of the things that they would always go to Germany when they met there, and they would have wonderful meals and drink beer, and they would socialize, and it mm -hmm. was very social. Yep. And they recognized when the Germans came over to the States, it was much more mechanical. Uh, yeah. it, it wasn't really around the food yeah. as much. They said, look, we have a meeting coming up. I want to have a good old fashioned American barbecue. Mm. And he arranged to have the finest meat uh, where they were meeting in Germany. And he had people bring bottles of the best Texas barbecue sauce. Oh, nice. <laughs> and they got there and they had this party and everyone had a good time. They really appreciated it. And, and it played through. As it so happened, a few days later, 
on their mission, there was a small uh, problem on on the harness Mm -hmm. of the system that they were working. It was a minor issue, Mm -hmm. but it required a technician Mm -hmm. to to do the repair. If they didn't repair it in time, it was going to put them back off of schedule. Yeah. Uh, their their project was small, so they were having to wait in a queue, and it was going to push them back. Yeah. As he was having that conversation, one of the technicians heard it and said, "Isn't that the barbecue people?" <laughs> and I said, "Yeah, that's Jerry Madden. That was that. That he he went over to Jerry. He said, uh, you know, Mr. Madden, I have my lunch break coming up in about a half hour. If you can wait, I will work that on my lunch break, and you'll oh, have it. In, you know, in about right. an hour after that. Yep." And he turned to all of us and he turned to me after he says, whatever you want to think about management and projects, that's project management, that's leadership. Yeah. It's always about the people. And yeah. so the big joke was uh, basically, you know, successful projects really revolve around the food oh, and the drink. For sure. And together. Yeah. For sure. So that, that is, uh, but again, he was a storyteller and he would tell yep. all these stories. Yep. And people learned from that uh, in terms yeah. of the core essence. Well, and and that's, I mean, that's going back throughout history. You know, before there were a lot of written stories, people would sit around as a community and talk about, you know, lessons and they would put them into stories so people would remember them. You can remember a story a lot easier than just a fact. And it's, it always, and I've made this mistake in, you know, early in my career, uh, when you're going in to, to, you know, do one of your first big presentations or something, and you have data to support your argument. And instead of crafting a narrative, a story around what that yeah. data is, is really trying to say, what is, what, what is the story it supports? Um, I've heard a lot of people, myself included back in the day say, well, I'm going to let the data speak for itself. Right. Data doesn't speak. Data yeah. is just numbers and there are things behind those numbers whether it's a mechanical part it's a person it's a disease there there's there's real things behind those numbers and you have to make those come to life and have to have your audience really feel for that and click with that for those numbers to really make a lot of meaning i mean they can see red and green and see good and bad, but until that you can resonate with them and really get them to understand why does this really matter? That's where you you really get people involved and, and successful. No, totally agree. Yeah. And again, I think it, re- it requires all these, it requires that technical capability of what you're yeah. doing right now requires knowledge. You, yep. you have things that I couldn't right now do unless I was prepared, yep. but also requires the ability to work with other people. That social yeah. dimension is is so important. And in many cases, more and more work is done globally. Very true. And so the ability to work across international cultures yep. is, I think, that that the factor. So we tend to focus, as we've said, in terms of what's the nature of the job mm-hmm. and what are the skills that have to be done when uh, really the big risks come down to how we uh, create our relationship together. Well, and you can have a lot of uh, miscommunication if you're not you know, actively creating a relationship with the people that you're working with. And I've seen this in good and bad ways, um, where if there is a miscommunication and people start to, you know, power up, like, well, I didn't mean, you know, that kind of thing, um, then it doesn't go so well. But I like to use those opportunities to say, oh, okay, that's interesting. Why, you know, especially with other cultures, I've worked with a lot of international folks, why did <laughs> I remember um, I talk very fast and I was I was doing some uh, demos and presentations to my colleagues uh, in, in China and they were like, Ashley, you have to slow yes. down. Yeah. We can understand you, but you talk way too fast for us. We're translating as you talk, you know, even small little things like that makes me, you know, step back and say, aha, I understand better. I have now educated myself a little bit better. And I think that, you know, um, not just the empathy, but that curiosity, you know, sometimes, uh, uh, you know, I I had people say, well, you know, you have to bring a gift, for instance, when you meet somebody for the first time. And, you know, in America, I'm a very hospitable person. So I like to do that anyways. 
Uh, but, you know, understanding there is actually a cultural meaning behind it and yeah. asking why, you know, be curious. I think that that's something that, um, to your earlier point, sometimes is a little discouraged. Like, well, you know, here's the facts. Here's how we're supposed to do it. Here's the standards, which are, again, important, but also having that curiosity to learn something else, something new is is really important. Yeah, and respecting the fact that different people and certainly different organizations and definitely different cultures, they they approach things differently. I was I was thinking and smiling to myself about the fast. Mm-hmm. So I grew up in New York and I mm-hmm. tend to uh speak fast. I we we were we had set up an international uh community uh in terms of the project community. How do you learn more effectively? How do you share mm-hmm. knowledge? And uh I had a uh, co-partner from the European Space Agency. Mm-hmm. Uh, Bettina Boom, who was a wonderful partner. And at one particular meeting, she, I was trying, I was getting nervous. She (laughs) said it right, that we weren't making progress. We weren't making Mm -hmm. a decision. Mm -hmm. And in my NASA New York brain, (laughs) you know, you're here in Paris, you're doing me, you got to go back with something. Yeah. And Bettina quietly whispered to me, she said, "Uh, you you have to slow down. (laughs) And I whispered back, I said, Bettina, if we go any slower, you know, we're going to be, you know, it's going to be a snail. And she, she left. She said, no, no. She said, um, you propose something out. And uh, our guests, our, our team members from Japan, they've heard that, but they need to take it back to discuss it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And you're, I think you're putting pressure on, and it, it'll go better. We're in a good place, but yeah. you need to. And she, she, she tri- you know, tripped tri- my mind in terms of you're absolutely right. Now's the time to to basically step back. And, and the call was exactly right. Yeah. So we get wrapped up into our own stories, how we've been mm-hmm. raised by our families, how quick we talk, how we do yeah. things. Yeah. And uh, it's important to have others to kind of to different. Uh, let's go to different pace. Yeah. Yeah. And, and um, you know, one of the tricks that I've learned because um, I do talk fast <laughs> and it's hard to not talk fast is to take a very deep breath. And even that small pause, first you get more oxygen to your brain. So you think better. And you also give people a moment uh, to ingest the things that you're saying instead of a rapid fire of, of communication. And I feel like that's, that's really, I I had, (laughs) I was forced to perfect that um, doing my PhD, uh, Wow. You know, when I was going in front of my committee, a lot of the stuff I was working on with knowledge graphs uh, was, you know, surprisingly kind of foreign to them. I mean, it was knowledge graph, the new graph, but knowledge graph was kind of a new thing right. at that time. And, you know, they kept saying, whoa, 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 go back, back, back up. I don't think I got that. And I thought, oh, that is not good from a committee that it's going to be in charge of my future. Uh, so I had to perfect the, okay, right? right. Like that, that right. pause. Um, and also for those watching uh, the video, I do a lot of that in my videos, but to make them uh, shorter, I cut those pauses out. Right. <laughs> so right. Yeah. I do actually practice this in, in real life. Um, but, but Ed, um, well, so- actually They say that, um, they say, it's been studied that teams- Mm-hmm. that uh, there are natural stop points for a team. Mm-hmm. And um, Connie Gersick actually studied a lot of this kind of stuff. But there's a notion that effective teams, effective leaders, um, they recognize where there's a natural pause mm-hmm. coming up. And they will use that period of time to recalibrate. Mm-hmm. Are we doing? Where are we? Do we need to rest? Do we need to? And based on that, they'll determine how to proceed. So it, it's it's that notion of pausing that's, true not only for us as individuals, but when we work together in projects and teams. Absolutely. And it's good for facilitation. I I was coaching someone um, a few months ago. Uh, He had never facilitated a conversation between two very strongly and opposed engineering teams. And I'm sure you've been in those situations too. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, Engineers can be very stubborn sometimes. Um, And this individual, instead of taking the pause and understanding that both sides were trying to uh, come up with a rebuttal or, you know, something along those lines, he kept filling the time with words. Right. And 
you know, after we got out of the meeting, I, I, I kind of pulled him aside and I said, how well did you think that went? He's like, I don't understand why nobody was talking. I said, <laughs> well, because you yeah. didn't give us time to talk. <laughs> yeah. Right. right. Uh, and so he didn't realize it and that's okay. You know, a lot of people, yeah. this is definitely a skill to be honed, right? Like some people have yeah. a natural affinity to public speaking. I'm very good at public speaking, but I was not great in the beginning. Mm-hmm. Like I made all kinds of mistakes. I still make mistakes. It's, it's, it's just like any other skill. You have to really refine it. And I think if you're a good public speaker, you're, you really do think of the audience, right? You always want to tailor what you're saying. You want to gauge the reactions, which is why doing this online is sometimes more difficult, right? You don't always see the right. body language of everyone, but, uh, you know, it's, I, I had a very good mentor, uh, that, that helped me along mm. the way. And I think that that's something when you were talking about, uh, the gentleman that came in and did, uh, the yeah. presentation and the barbecue and all of that, I, that, that I think is another piece to it. The, the mentorship, it sounds like he was actually mentoring a lot of people and Absolutely. they would go on and they would mentor, right? Yeah. So it's, it's kind of a spreading effect, which is, I think is a good thing. Well, it's also the, uh, you know, one of the the principles in the book is, you know, I have six principles. One of them is knowledge. Mm-hmm. And people will get confused about knowledge, what it is it. Uh, and obviously we understand it's, it's the know-how you mm-hmm. have to have to be successful at whatever you're doing. Uh, but knowledge in an organization, it's embedded in its people. Yes. Not, not so much an individual, but in its aggregate, right? That's mm-hmm. why you have these teams that come together. That's why you have mm-hmm. the communities. And a key aspect of this knowledge is that it flows through networks. Yes. And mentors, I always tell people, I tell my, my students, have as many mentors as you can can stay connected to. Yeah. Because, you you know, I had mentors who really understood, uh, you know, um, issues around being innovative. Mm-hmm. I knew people who understood great the political aspect of things. <laughs> I had mentors who were just friends. Yeah. Who... Um, you know, could make me feel better about myself, uh, you know, for different ways. But, but the knowledge really, it, it's through how we connect with each, each uh, uh, person. It's about the aggregate yeah. of how we make decisions. And, you know, we really learn from others and yeah. from listening and learning and having those mentors is vital. Absolutely. And, you know, it's, it's even picking up on those tips and tricks, right? Like that you, you find along the way and things that are not in the textbook, uh, things that you just find out through happenstance. And and yes. those are beautiful moments. And if you can share that with people, you are then spreading that knowledge, right? Like that's the actual knowledge and, and yeah. the spread of, and building, right? Like it, knowledge is not yeah. a vacuum. It's, it's not a learning moment and then it's gone. It's a building yeah. process, right? So to, to your point of that, it's that network Every person is sharing and building up the the next person, which is, uh, you know, if you don't have that, then you're just stagnant and nobody wants right. that. <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's vital around some of the key things you're talking about. It it, it requires a commitment. Uh, yeah. One of the things you were talking about earlier was, uh, you know, you t- take time to get better at communicating. Mm-hmm. You take time to understand these things. One of the things that, again, what often I don't see in organizations or in typical ones, is they, they'll put money in their technology. They'll put money in a database system. Mm-hmm. The biggest issue that, that is difficult for people when I talk to them is the lack of time to think, yep. to reflect, to have yep. conversations, to learn. That's that commitment to developing our social and, and uh, our interpersonal skills that's so vital. Yeah. And many of the yeah. best organizations, they create spaces mm-hmm. just for people to come together and do what we're doing, to have conversations. To talk, which encourages, uh, you know, serendipitous encounters, serendipitous encounters. We start talking, we run into each other and it leads to ideas and innovations Mm -hmm. and possibilities. So. Absolutely. And and I do have a cautionary tale for um, a, a, a company that's been around for a very long time, many, many decades that um, I was working with uh, even quite recently. And one thing that I noticed uh that they did not do is there was no learning on the job. None. Right. You know, yeah. I'm, I'm used to, you know, most places at least will have, you know, like, Oh, here's this, you know, training, or if you want to do a Coursera or any, you know, little yeah, things right. like that, this organization did not even allow that amount of time. They didn't even, mm. you know, help wow. even fund some of those things. 
And I'm not exaggerating when I say they were at least, if I'm being even generous, 10, maybe 12 years out of date in all technology spaces. Oh, wild. And they were still very successful, right? Like they oh. were um, still producing what they needed to produce for their okay. clientele, but they couldn't understand why they, and this is funny too, they couldn't understand why those darn millennials I'm sorry, but millennials are now 40. They're not yeah. they're not the younger generation. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. No. That no. by itself showed their yeah. their um, wow. not being connected. That's wild. And I thought, wow, they don't realize that their clientele that still loves them is diminishing and retiring and going on and doing different things. And they're yeah. not updating. And that is what happens when you become stagnant and you don't invest in your people, is yeah. the people that you know, like to be in this the the ivory tower. They they are the pillar of knowledge. Mm -hmm. They stick around because they love that feeling, right? And they're right. very you know invested in the organization. That's not necessarily a bad thing to be invested in organization, right. but to not share that knowledge and also not to help the newcomers, you know, get up to speed. That's not a really good way to to sustain yourself. So I've yeah. seen it in practice, and it is not pretty. <laughs> Yeah, it can't work. I mean, in, in a world of change and part of what most organizations are dealing with, it sounds like you worked with one or you knew one that uh, must have I been knew one. Very, I didn't work for them. I worked with them. You, and it was you work with them. It must have been a very static yes. kind of industry because in general, one of the challenges that all organizations are dealing with is how do you deal with the changes? Yeah. You know, technologies are out of date, uh, what, mm -hmm. three to six months out. Yeah. Uh, new different views of people, geopolitical changes. Mm -hmm. uh, the work that's done is so impact constantly by change that and change requires then uh, this knowledge dynamism requires new knowledge, new capabilities, which means you have to have the learning constantly happening. Yeah. You have to have a culture that's that puts aside its ego and yeah. is comfortable with what it doesn't know. So, I love um, that. Yeah. I love that. And and you do mention something in the book, radical uncertainty. Um, right. I kind of think dovetails into that. Can you describe what that means? Yeah, I, I mean, we're we're just dealing in a, in a world where you don't know what's coming. Most of the organizations I've been fortunate enough since I left NASA to work with are currently very successful. Mm -hmm. And this is interesting. I hadn't thought about this actually until you raised this question 30 seconds ago. <laughs> when I started at NASA, when a manager asked me 30 years ago, let's say, mm -hmm. when, when they would ask me to come and work with them is because they had something in mind to change mm -hmm. strategic planning, a transition, mm -hmm. a conflict or something. Today, just about all the organizations and leaders I talk to, they're successful right now, mm -hmm. but they're very scared about disruption for tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So the whole discussion is really how do we anticipate the future? Yeah. How yeah. do we uh, change for not just, I'm not talking five years, how do we change for next year? Yeah. yeah. How do we understand the future of work and how do we uh, create that kind of an adaptive, agile, change-oriented yeah. uh, you know, place of work? So it's a very different, it, it's a complete shift. Yeah. And I would imagine it would be tough for some people, uh, you know, People from my generation, we grew up in a very different time. Change was not the norm yeah. 30 years ago. It was unusual. Now yeah. it's it's taken for granted. Yeah. And so this is the, I think that that key kind of issue. So radical uncertainty isn't some concept. It's how we live. Yeah. Uh, we don't understand about uh, you know different issues around technologies, around the political environment. Mm -hmm. Who gonna who will be our partners? What are the risks? The yeah. greatest risk for most projects. Are the are the social relationships and how those change? So in this yeah. space of really great uncertainty, uh, coupled with uh, the notion of volatility and change, mm -hmm. and all the things going on, really the ultimate defense is the ability to continuously learn yeah. and to adapt and be able to be positioned for uh, being successful uh, in, in this world that's bouncing around. Well, and I love too that you're saying that it's the ability to learn and adapt, not chase after the next shiny object. <laughs> right. Because I think well, that's the shiny objects change too. Yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah. 